Welcome to The Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. Recorded at RockVox Recording and Production Studios, Rochester, New York, mouth off at RockVox, rockvox rockvox.com. Having enjoyed an almost 40-year career facilitating his own authentic brand of The Helping Conversation, your host, Executive and Recovery Coach, Keith Greer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Helping Conversation. I hope that you have enjoyed the first three episodes of this season, our conversation with Leah Milton and Anisha Jacko and Aaron Lindstrom. And I thought I'd do something a little bit different this season, the second season, uh, and that is that I would like every few episodes to spend some time with you without a guest, uh, just talking about and highlighting some of the specific helping skills, helping strategies that my guests have talked about uh, during each of their own episodes. I have a bit of a bias uh, about people who help. And yes, it, it is a big bias because this is something that I have done for closing in on 40 years. And my bias is that I think societally, we still minimize a bit the complexity of what helping people do. And uh, the greatest piece of evidence for that is that we refer to the skills of helping people as the, quote, soft skills. In fact, uh, anyone who knows me would uh, agree that if you really want to piss me off, um, refer to what helping people do as the soft skills. There's nothing soft about it. Uh, we could call them the crucial skills, since I think it is a safe bet that the largest source of happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment and the potentially largest sauce, source of sadness and despair rests in our relational world. So it is not saying too much to put a premium on interpersonal skills, on people skills. I also know that in the world of professional helping, there is a lot more involved here than just being a caring and compassionate person. I, I ask this question every single time I do any kind of training or I'm up in front of the room uh, in front of uh, aspiring clinicians or coaches or, or other people in the helping world. And, and I'll ask how many of you uh, if you go back as long as you can remember, would describe yourself as a person who, from your first breath, is inherently caring, compassionate, empathic, uh, intuitive. And every time I ask that question, almost every single hand, if not every single hand in the room goes up, that these are who we are. These are the people we are. This is how we came into the world. This is how we're wired. You can give me the disc. You can give me the people map. You can give me any of those personality profiles. And I, like many other people in the helping profession, will score very high around our ability and intuition in interacting with others, as well as our own level of self-awareness. So that's just there. I, give in, I, I just give, give it that that's there. But then I say to whoever I'm speaking to, and I believe this with every fiber of my being, that if you want to become a professional helper and create a long, successful, happy, fulfilling, satisfying career, that all of those innate ways of being, those innate characteristics that we came into the world with, while a prerequisite to do this work, they are not sufficient. And so where we then need to take the conversation is what else? And that's where we get into skills, strategies, what the evidence tells us, what the world of research tells us that we can use in our work as helping people. And again, uh, as you all know, I'm not just talking about the traditional helping professions of psychology or social work or counseling or coaching. I'm talking about anybody who engages another human being in a helping conversation, looking to help that person, that group, that organization move forward. So I want to take a few minutes today to 
go back over the first three episodes and highlight some of the strategies, some of the skills, some of the ways of being. Uh, I, I like to even talk a little bit about, you know, with helping people, their specific superpower, what they bring to this conversation that just really works for the people that they help and brings a level of satisfaction into their lives uh, as helping people. So let's start with Leah. I mentioned in the podcast episode with Leah what a joy it was being able to sit down with her in this way uh, because uh, I have a, a her mom is a, a longtime uh, cherished colleague and friend. And so I literally have known Leah since the day she was born and to watch uh, to watch her journey uh, in her own life uh, in inviting adventure in and now using that lived experience to share with others and to coach others into how to bring adventure into people's lives. And, and so what I thought about in regards to the work that Leah does is the first place my head went is this concept of a multi- potentialite. So I've been doing a little reading about it, and, and it's an interesting concept to describe people who have varied interests, um, varied skills, uh, certain traits and characteristics around how they learn and experience the world. And these are the folks, and I, I, I just think of this whenever I think of Leah, these are the folks who struggle following the traditional path that most of us have been taught to follow, which is go to school, maybe go to college, get a job, be happy in that job, and being in that job, be in that job for 30 to 40 years, and then you retire. And I think we can safely say that just in the world today, that path probably is no more. Uh, there's some interesting research out there around some of the younger generations uh, entering the workplace, that they're not looking for that. That tends to be a little bit more of the mindset that that my generation, I'm 61, was raised with. And that more and more people are saying, but wait, there's a variety of things I'm interested in. I have a variety of passions that I would like to follow. And I always think of that when I think of Leah, because in many ways she did that. She did not follow the traditional path. And as we talked about in our episode, you know, had a variety of people weighing in in her life uh, over her years questioning why she was not following that traditional path. And I know in some of the coaching I have done with people who have a passion, especially in the arts, music, um, performing arts, that part of their challenge is that all along the way, they often have had a variety of well-meaning people in their life saying, well, that's a, that's a great interest area. It's a great passion. But when are you going to get started with your life? When are you going to find that job that you can settle down into? And the difficulty that many of these people have attempting to follow that path because it's not the path that their heart lays out for them. And yes, I know we have to pay the bills and we need health insurance and all of that. So I'm not minimizing any of that. That adds to the complexity. But I just found myself thinking over and over uh, during my conversation with Leah about the gift she brings to her work in inviting people to consider a non-traditional path, to essentially give permission to think about what might I do if I did exactly what I wanted to do. And in her case, a little bit more specifically, how might I bring adventure into my life? And so I did a little research because I just found myself really curious about adventure. Like, like, what is that? Because I want to think that in many, many ways, in our role as helping people, regardless of the conversation we're in and regardless of the environment we do our helping conversation in, that you could make an argument that at the end of the day, we are the folks who support people in being adventurous now, maybe that adventure could be, you know, go and, uh, you know, climb the highest mountain. Maybe that adventure could be just giving yourself permission to think differently. Maybe that adventure could be getting support to make some choices in your life that you have been thinking about for a long time, but have hesitated 
in moving towards them. So I love this concept of adventure. And and I found this really cool article. It started with a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, quote, the purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experience. And it even went a bit further to talk about some research that is out there. Um, that approximately 42% of Americans can't remember the last time they attempted adventure. So almost 50% of us are, are in a way of life that, that does not include adventure. And I, I just always get curious about that, uh, and very much so with many people that I have worked with uh, as, a, as a coach, of what would be involved in inviting adventure into your life. And yet, uh, there's some surveys out there that would then say more than half of Americans listed uh, list visiting new places as something that is a priority. These are often items that are on their, their bucket list that they want to do. Um, they often want to do it with other people, and there's some pretty good there's some pretty good research out there. Something published an article published in the Journal of Psychological Science that found that engaging in a positive activity with a pal uh, just amplified the enjoyment even more. So we know these anything we do where we invite adventure into our life helps. And this is the last piece that was in the article that I found fascinating: that new experiences can change how we view time. So they quote a neuroscientist by the name of David Eagleman, who explains how our bias for the familiar affects how fast we think time flies, because our brain is wired to keep a hold of what we know, which is one of the challenges of inviting adventure in any way, shape, or form into our lives. Um, So Dr. Eagleman goes on to explain... This explains why we think that time speeds up when we grow older. Uh, Eagleman said, why childhood summers seem to go on forever while old age slips by while we're dozing. The more familiar the world becomes, the less information your brain writes down and the more quickly time seems to pass. So I found myself as I read that just thinking of this work that Leah does of inviting people to do something different. And that different, it appears, in the neuroscience world, actually helps slow down time. Uh, And boy, in in this day and age of a worldwide pandemic where I know that, that I am experiencing that sensation of not knowing what day it is or every day feels the same or what time is it, uh, it really some words of wisdom and, and lends itself to, to celebrate the work that Leah does in inviting people to think adventurously, to break out of a mold, to give themselves permission to, to think big. And uh, in a few minutes when we, when we talk about some of the work that Aaron was doing, we're going to talk about this concept of possibility thinking. Leah also talked about using her skills of curiosity and empathy and combining that with some really, really deep listening. And I love this concept of of curiosity. Uh, And and the way I've always thought about it is if, if what we do is helping people when we engage our clients in the practice of curiosity is we take whatever the situation is that they are talking about. And if we could take that situation and create a 3D model of it and hold it up in front of us, curiosity would be the practice of looking at that 3D representation and turning it at all these different angles and looking at it up, down, from the side. But here's a key component of the helping skill of curiosity, that we do that and we teach the people we work with to do it without judgment. That that's what curiosity is. Us human beings are so quick to rush to judgment. Good, bad, right, wrong. And often, I, I know in my work that, that often one of the ways of being that I believe get in the way of people moving their lives in the direction they want is they come up with an idea and they immediately judge it right, wrong, good, or bad, or they listen to the judgment of others. Instead of engaging in the practice of curiosity, which means I'm just going to look at it. I'm just going to look at it from all sides, all angles. 
I'm not going to render judgment. I'm going to, you know, I like to use the word percolate. I'm going to kind of percolate on it. I'm going to kind of, hmm, wonder, let me, let me think about this for a while. To give ourselves permission to look at something in that manner and not feel that we have to rush to any kind of judgment. I just was really struck as, as Leah talked about that, of bringing this curiosity eye to the work that she does. And again, combining it with, with an empathic heart and the wonderful, wonderful helping skill of deep listening. Uh, the author, John Bythway, has a quote. Our world is drowning in a sea of self-centeredness. You can make yourself quite unique right away by leaving this ocean of selfishness and choosing to be curious about other people. I love that. What a gift that is to ourselves to be curious about others. And what a gift that is in the helping realm to invite the people we work with to this place of curiosity. It's a, it's a very challenging place for people to get to. Because again, I would argue that we have all been schooled to be judgmental uh, towards others and even more so uh, towards ourselves. Albert Einstein said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. I love that. So how can we invite curiosity into our lives? And how, as helping people, do we invite curiosity do we invite our clients, the people we work with, to be curious about themselves, their motivations, what they want, their ideas? It's really one of the other ways that we communicate to the people we work with that we view them as a full resource in their life, that they have their answers, their ideas are relevant. It just also means that we don't have to put an idea out on the table and rush to judgment about it. We can sit with it for a while and learn from it. Leah also talked about the role of value clarification with her clients. And in fact, she talked about how impactful that was in her work with a coach of identifying some of those core beliefs and then moving from there to figure out how to honor them, how to bring them alive uh, in your life. And I have found that to, I really resonated with that when, when Leah was talking about that. I have found that to be so true in all of my work. It's one of the it's an exercise that I do relatively quickly with most people that I work with is to just engage in a few different activities around identifying your maybe five to 10 core values. And if you think of a value as a philosophy or a belief that resonates so deeply in our soul that when we align our behavior with it, it the world just feels right. We just feel right. In fact, one of the greatest definitions of stress that I have ever heard is that when you are experiencing stress, it is a moment when you are being blocked from living one of your core values. I, f I find that a, a wonderful definition and a wonderful question to ask yourself the next time you feel your shoulders hunched or your jaw is tight, whatever your f physical signs are of, of experiencing stress and you're not exactly sure where it's coming from, to simply ask, what core value am I being blocked from living? Now, to answer that question well, Obviously, you need to have some insight into what your core values are. There's a variety of value clarification exercises out there. Um, all of them, you, you need to find the one as a helping person that, that, that seems to work the best for you. Um, I have this exercise that I use called the value sort. In fact, if you Google um, value card sort, you will probably find it. It's out there in the public domain. Uh, and it's just a listing of almost 100 different values, and uh, it invites people to literally sort this this uh, list of values uh, it, until they can get into their most important pile. Uh, I shoot for 10 of 15. There's some research out there that talks about that if we do enough of this work, we can probably distill our core values down to about 5 to 10. And this is our software. These are our, our drivers. This is, again, what, what moves us through the world in a way that, that derives meaning and satisfaction. Or, as I've said, if, if we're not honoring them, uh, leads to stress. And so it's a wonderful exercise for helping people, regardless of, of who you are, uh, the environment you work in, the client you're working with, 
anything that has to do with engaging a person in a conversation where that person is considering doing something different, moving in a new direction, as we've already talked about, inviting adventure into their life in some form. It's a really, really helpful prerequisite conversation uh, that, that can help people put some structure on, essentially create a roadmap. If, if, if I take all of these choices in front of me and I filter them through my values, hmm, which of those choices might call on more of these values than another? might empower me to act on them in a way that is meaningful to me. So it's it's not a, a be-all and end-all in figuring out all of the complex decisions in our lives, but it can be really helpful. So I just really appreciated Leah's conversation uh, about how to bring value, clarification to her work. And again, I, I, in all of my work, I've never, I've never done it where, where the person I was working with didn't walk away with something pretty significant. Uh, it tends to just seems to be one of those conversations that we're not often asked to engage in. We, we talk about it in a lot of ways. We love using the word value. Um, but I find that, that most folks I've worked with, when asked to engage in some specific value clarification work, often have never done that before. And, and so really do walk away with some greater clarification about what is important to them. So I really thank Leah for being with us uh, and sharing her journey, her personal journey, as well as how she now um, engages that journey, a journey in uh, her coaching work uh, with others. And um, at this time, when we are hunkered down, Due to uh, a worldwide pandemic, the conversation about figuring out other ways to invite adventure into our lives is a really worthwhile conversation. My next guest uh, was Anisha Jacko, who is an educational leader and uh, 21 years of experience in the education field. And let me just say right now, before we move into any conversation about the specifics of my conversation with Anisha, how much I, and I hope all of you, appreciate everything that everyone in the educational world is doing right now. And whether that's public ed, private ed, ed, secondary ed, uh, it is very, very clear, and I say this without judgment, it just seems to be a fact, that our educational systems were not created with a worldwide pandemic in mind. And so what they have had to do, the shifts, quick shifts that they have had to make on the fly, trying to figure out how to deliver a quality education to all of the people that they have a responsibility to, it, it just it amazes me. And, and uh, as many of you know, I spent 30 years in public ed as a school social worker. Uh, and in my conversation with many of my colleagues, uh, I just can't believe what they're being asked to do, what they are doing. Uh, and let me also say to, to all of the students out there, you know, what they're willing to do in terms of, of weathering, both being in school, being online. I had us off to every single parent especially you parents who have multiple kids in school right now. I, it, it just, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And uh, we really, really need to appreciate how hard all of the helping people that exist within the world of education uh, are working to, to keep their system moving forward during an absolute time of craziness. So one of the first things that struck me uh, in my conversation with Anisha was, was, she quickly talked about that it, when she was a, a teacher, before she became an administrator and a building principal, that her first priority when she walked in the, the classroom and she worked with, with younger children was to establish herself as likable. I love that. Absolutely love that. Any of us who have worked with, uh, with children, with teens, know that as a population, that is a group of folks that you cannot BS. You cannot walk in the room and attempt to be something you're not because they will call you on it, they will bust you on it, and much more importantly, you will blow any chance of creating trust with them. Their, their BS meter is off the charts good, 
And so one of the first things that any helping person who is going to work with children and teenagers needs to think about is this concept of authenticity. How do I walk in the room and truly be who I am? And so I love this having this conversation with other helping folk uh, about how people think about the concept of authenticity. What does that mean? It's a, it's a bit of a nebulous concept. So I can tell you what it, it means for me uh, in my crazy head. So I have this, this idea in my head that if in a room, people from different contexts of my life came together. So it could be family, it could be close friends, it could be casual friends, it could be colleagues, it could be clients I've worked with through the years, um, people I know in a variety of different shapes and forms. If they were all in a room together and somehow the conversation about me came up, that all of them would say, yeah, that's Keith. That there's a consistency to who I am from interaction to interaction, from person to person, from context to context, that I'm not different. You know, in the business world, they would call it maybe your brand, that there's a consistency to your brand. That's authenticity. I'm real. I'm honest. I'm genuine. That this is who I am. This is how I come at the world. I think a part of, of being an authentic person is knowing what your strengths are, as well as knowing what are some of the ways of being that you're still working on. And again, if you want a really, a really, really good measure, a really good barometer of your ability to be authentic, uh, walk into a room and, uh, with uh, young folk and start engaging with them because they'll, they'll tell you, right? They, they'll be pretty direct with you. So I really appreciated uh, what Anisha talked about and, and also thought about that, that being authentic is not as simple as people think it is. Again, I think it's one of those skills that people just assume helping people have and it, it kind of comes natural. But there's a little bit more to it of really thinking about who you want to be, how you are. And again, that, that word consistent just keeps popping into my head of a consistency from person to person, interaction to interaction, context to context. Anisha also talked about something that really rung true for me from my days as a family therapist uh, and, and my days as, as a school social worker. And that was her recognition that, especially in working with children, she would do herself a great favor in putting a primary focus on engaging parents, on, inc on creating relationships with parents. So uh, I'll share a bias of mine again from, from the world of family therapy when I was doing family therapy. Um, almost all of it with moms, dads, caregivers, acting out teen. Um, in my day, it was a, a, lot of, a lot of teens that were struggling with some level of substance use disorder. And one of the things I've found over the years, and in, in, again, in my, in my training world of working with clinicians uh, and coaches who are thinking about doing some kind of family-oriented work, is that these are often people who, who really do uh, relate to teens, are really good at that. They're really good at the authentic part. But sometimes I would argue, overemphasize the need to create connection with the teen versus creating connection with the parents. And while both are very important, one of the things that, that became very apparent early in, in my career as a family therapist in that world of helping is that if change is going to happen in a family, I need to have a relationship with the power structure in the family, and that's the caregivers. That if my, if my primary focus is that I just need to create this wonderful relationship with, the, with the, the child or the teen, that I'm missing the point. Because as I've always said, and this sounds a little porky, but you know, unless you, if you work with teens, unless you're willing to take them home with you, then they're going to go home to their families. And so do we need to think about that? And so when it, that really struck me when Anisha talked about that, that, that in her role as a, as a helper within the teaching world, she got that for me to be at my best in helping my students move forward, I need to foster a trusting relationship with their parents. And that is not always easy. And I found in 
in my years in, in public ed, and this would be one of the, the pieces of the, the system that, that I would love to see be different. And that is a tendency from kindergarten through 12th grade to have less and less of a focus on engaging parents to the point where in many cases by high school, I, I interacted with many people over the years, wonderful, well-meaning people who would say, we, we don't really need to engage the parents here. You know, we've got a 16, 17 year old. And I would make the argument that might be a moment in that child's life where it is even more important that we engage the parents than when they were five or six. So how do we go about as helping people if we are in the world of helping that includes any kind of family work? How do we go about creating that relationship with parents? Anisha also talked about what I would label her ability to make herself vulnerable as a leader. So now we're, you know, she talked about her role in the classroom and now she's talking about uh, again, at the time of of the episode, it was like two weeks that she had walked into this brand new position as a building principal of an elementary school in the middle of, of a worldwide pandemic. And the importance for her of having a meeting with every single staff member and coming at her leadership from the standpoint of what do you need from me? What can I do for you? And a couple of things came up. Um, one was was the role of vulnerability, which we can we'll talk about in a minute. But the other concept that that hit me is leaders in the role of servant leader. And so I want to just read a, a a short passage from an article entitled "The Art of Servant Leadership" by Mark Taralo. Servant leaders are a revolutionary bunch. They take the traditional power leadership model and turn it completely upside down. The new hierarchy puts the people or employees in a business context at the very top and the leader at the bottom, charged with serving the employees above them, and that's just the way servant leaders like it. That's because these leaders possess a serve-first mindset, and they are focused on empowering and uplifting those who work for them. They are serving instead of commanding showing humility instead of brandishing authority, and always looking to enhance the development of their staff members in ways that unlock potential, creativity, and sense of purpose. The end result, performance goes through the roof, says Art Barter, founder and CEO of the Servant Leadership Institute and CEO of Datron World Communications Incorporated. Magic happens, agrees Pat Filodico, a former executive leader at, a, uh, at IBM, who is now CEO of the Robert K. Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. Experts are often describe the majority of traditional business leaders as managers who mainly function as overseers of a transaction, employees maintain desired performance levels, and in exchange they receive salary and benefits. Generally, these managers are positional leaders. They derive authority from the fact that they are the boss. The servant leader moves beyond the transactional aspect of management and instead actively seeks to develop and align an employee's sense of purpose with the company mission. The fruits of these labors are bountiful, servant leadership advocates say. Empowered staff will perform at a high innovative level. Employees feel more engaged and purpose-driven, which in turn increases the organization's retention and lowers turnover costs. Well-trained and trusted staffers continue to develop as future leaders, thus helping to assure the long-term viability of the organization. As I listened to Anisha talk about how she has come at creating her relationships with her new staff, the the concept of servant leadership popped into my head. And I know in my work in the corporate world, boy, across industries, there is still, still well-represented is a you know a mindset of convince, coerce, and control, tell, sell, yell. I'm the boss. And what do we know? We know that that, that does little to create relationship with people. Uh, it does very little, if anything, to develop trust with people. Uh, and when you look at some of the research on why people leave jobs, very, very rarely do people leave jobs because they feel they are not well compensated. 
people leave jobs because they are not happy, because they feel not appreciated, because they feel micromanaged, uh, because they, they view themselves as or, or feel that they are being viewed as just kind of a widget. So it's, again, as they talked about in that article, it's that transactional nature. You do this, this, and this, and I'll provide you with a salary. And yet I am seeing more and more and more articles that are coming out that would support the perspective of Anisha, that leadership needs to change, that leadership is about relationships, that leadership is about self-awareness on the part of the leader, that leadership is about empowering others, treating people as a resource, believing that the folks who work with you have their answers and the best interests of your organization at heart, and that your job as a leader is to foster that. Steve Jobs once said, uh, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And I just thought Anisha talked about some wonderful examples of how she is asking her staff, what do you need from me? What do you bring? Tell me how I can be in service to you. Anisha also, in the in that same conversation, and I don't remember if in the episode we used this, this word, I think we did, is, is her ability to make herself vulnerable. And again, in the leadership world, uh, I had this conversation a few months ago with a client of mine um, who was really, really struggling in, in, uh, in his role as a, a leader within his organization of being in moments where he didn't know, he didn't have the answers, and his belief, this message in his head as a leader that he always needed to have the answers, needed to look in control, and the, the level of anxiety and worry that that created for him because somewhere in that inner dialogue, he, he realized, I don't have the answers, so that must say something negative about me. And we had a series of wonderful conversations uh, about the role of vulnerability and some of our newer and updated thinking about the power of leaders showing vulnerability, saying, I don't know, you tell me, I don't have all the answers. Yeah, this is a pretty crazy time for all of us right now. In the world of conversational intelligence, we know that some of the latest research in the neuroscience world, tells us that when a leader demonstrates a vulnerability to the people in their organization, shows them, I do not know, I do not have the answer, we're in this together, what do you think? That those acts of vulnerability actually increase the production of oxytocin in the brain of these other folk. So oxytocin, some people know it, that it's our cuddle hormone. It's the hormone that we create that gives us a sense of closeness and trust and safety with others in our relationship world. And so when a leader moves from, I know everything, and I'm going to baffle you with BS if I don't, to, no, I don't know, you tell me, that that works for them. Now, I know for many leaders that I have conversation with, at first, that feels a bit counterintuitive that that will actually work, but it, but it does. We, we know that. We know that that fosters relationship, that fosters trust, that fosters connection, that fosters a sense of inclusiveness. We're in this together. We're all in this together. And I just really found myself thinking a lot about that with Anisha and how well she must be doing that right now and walking into this new position. And again, at, at a time in our world where things just feel absolutely upside down for folks. So my hat is off to Anisha, to all of her colleagues in the world of education uh, as they do their amazing work in moving our children forward in a way that nobody could have predicted at the start of uh, last school year. My next guest was Aaron Lindstrom, who uh, also is a sales strategist, a money mindset coach, uh, does a lot of work in the coaching world, um, business development world. And Aaron talked about some other 
helping concepts and strategies that I just really wanted to highlight. So the first, I mentioned this earlier when, when I was talking about, um, when I was talking about Leah, is this concept of possibility thinking. Erin talked about that, of how she engenders possibility thinking with her clients. And, and that's not just a kind of fancy word. That is a very, very, very powerful helping concept, helping skills of inviting people to think about possibilities because our wonderful brain tends to focus on a couple of things and that's it. But there's another, another aspect of, of engaging people in possibility thinking that, that I have found really important and powerful uh, in, in my work as a helping person. So I would imagine all of you who are listening to me today, like me, have that wonderful self-critic in your head. You know that voice, that voice that goes off when you maybe try to think about possibilities or want to invite adventure into your life. And that voice says, no, don't do it. All hell's going to break loose. Who are you? Stop thinking big. You know, stick to what you know. We all have that voice. In fact, some of us can probably even identify exactly who from somewhere in her life is that voice. But, but even if the, the voice is a bit nebulous, it's powerful. And it's the voice of the status quo, and it keeps us limited in our thinking. To engage in possibility thinking, there's a, another voice that we need to help raise the volume on, and that is the voice of strength. And so Erin also talked about being very strength-based in her work, working very hard right from the beginning with, with the people that she helps in engaging a conversation around what their strengths and capacities are. And so what really resonated with me there is, is, is how powerful that is in creating an offset, offsetting voice for the self-critic. So go with me here for a second. I believe that most of us come into adulthood and the loudest voice in our head is that self-critic. It just keeps us not, keeps us in a place, stuck, not being willing to stretch out. There is another voice that we have, and for a variety of different reasons that have, oh, much to do with a whole laundry list of societal messages and narratives, this voice we come into adulthood and it just loses its volume. And that's the voice of our intuition. And our intuition is our inner wisdom. Now, I believe if you think about little children, little children are totally in touch with their inner wisdom. They're totally in touch with their strengths. They'll let you know. And then somewhere as we head through childhood into adolescenthood and into adulthood, that voice quiets. And in our wonderful society, we hear things like, don't be boastful, don't be too full of yourself. And, and so we, we listen to that and we adhere to that. But then by the time we hit adulthood, the only, thing, only voice left in our head for many of us is that self-critic. And so then we engage in a helping conversation with someone, coaching or, or some kind of clinical conversation, which is, again, about moving forward and trying new things and taking risks. And the only voice we hear in our head is, don't do that. Don't step out of your comfort zone. Bad stuff is going to happen. Don't think too big of yourself. And so when Aaron was talking about both of these concepts of possibility thinking and being strength-based, I found myself thinking about how do we help people in our role as helpers in retuning back in to their intuition, into their inner voice of wisdom. But to do that, we have to give that voice some language because for many of us many years ago we lost that language and the language of our inner wisdom is strength but go up to somebody and ask them to tell you what's wonderful about them ask people you know to tell you what their strengths are and their capacities and and people will look down and they'll shuffle their feet and they'll get embarrassed and and they'll say ah oh, i don't want to be too full of myself and i find that fascinating Absolutely fascinating that for many adults, they come to a place where they want to engage in a helping conversation and they don't even know what's in their toolbox. 
And so I do a very simple exercise with, with the folks that I work with. I simply ask people to make a list of strengths, but there's a caveat. And that is that I ask people to create a list of strengths, positive attributes, positive characteristics, skills, talents, you name it. And the list has to have as many items as they are old. And so what I find in my many years of, of, of doing this exercise with, with folks is if that person I ask is anything older than 10, they look at me like I'm the craziest guy in the world. And it's that look that tells me every single time how important this conversation is. Because I've asked this of, I don't know how many hundreds, thousands of people. And every single time the person looks at me and says, you're crazy. I'm 34. I'm 50. I'm whatever. A list as long as I am old. But if we don't give our inner wisdom, it's language back. Then we're left with that self-critic voice. And so when people like Aaron invite their clients into possibility thinking, possibility comes from knowing what you bring to the table. Possibility comes from knowing what your strengths and capacities are. And there's nothing about this conversation that, that is either or. So it doesn't mean that we stop looking at some of the things we struggle with, right? Places we really want to grow. I get that. that that's still there. But my work in the helping world tells me that's not the list that we really need to worry about. We need to worry about the fact that most people don't have the other list. And we need to challenge them to come up with that because that, those are their tools. That will become the foundation of, oh, there are other possibilities out there. Oh, to go back to, to uh, Leah, oh, I, I do want to do something adventurous and I can make that happen. So I really just wanted to acknowledge you know, what Aaron was talking about around inviting people in to this place of possibility. But the work that we probably will need to do prior to that, also back to what Leah talked about, about values clarification, those two things, values clarification and, and your strengths and capacities, those are two wonderful pieces of data when you're going to be engaging anyone in moving forward, thinking about possibilities uh, inviting them to just think big about themselves and where they want their lives to go. Aaron also talked about this concept of holding space, which which I just adore. And it really is, th this is one of those helping concepts, helping skills that goes way beyond, again, just being an inherently caring and compassionate and empathic person is what exactly a helping person does in the room with the person they're helping to create, create a space that is safe, that is trusting, that is honoring, that communicates to the people we're working with that, that you can be who you want to be in this space, that there will be absolutely no judgment. There will only be celebration of who you are, where you want to go, the vision you have, even if, you're, even if you haven't taken a step towards that vision, that's a phenomenal piece that we bring as helping people. Because I'm sure any of you who are listening who are in the helping world, you have had the experience that I have had where in, 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 in my days as a clinician, as a social worker, as a coach, that in that space – if I have done what I need to do to create that, to foster that, that people share things in that space that maybe, maybe have never seen the light of day prior to that moment. And that is just one of the most phenomenal aspects of helping is that precious, vulnerable, unique moment where something comes into that space that has never been uttered before. And now we can get curious about it. Now we can, we can attach values to it, strengths to it, mull it over and engage in, hmm, what if, what if I tried this? And so I am, would imagine, and I know this is true for me, for any of you who are listening who have 
worked with a helping person anywhere in your life. When I think of helping people I've worked with, therapists, coaches over the years for my own personal growth, this is one of those skills that that differentiate some from another is this ability to just create and hold this safe space, nurturing space. And I would imagine for anyone who works with Erin that that would be one of the true gifts that she uh, brings into the world. And I want to say one other thing about this safe space, creating this space, is one of the, the, the biggest conversations going on right now in the world of psychology, it's definitely going on in the world of leadership, is this concept of emotional regulation, that, that to be the best as leaders, that emotional regulation skills are really important. And so one of the things I have definitely found in my work that is a byproduct of creating this space is for folks who walk in who are maybe still working on their emotional regulation skills, that this space becomes a safe place to experiment, right? a safe place to explore some ways of being that maybe for the, the, the person historically create some impulsiveness or discomfort and that that's maybe one of the other really, really big benefits of having this space created, that people can try things out, try new ways of being on um, in, it, with their permission. You know, you are there to provide some level of feedback, to get curious with them. And we know, boy, oh my, in our world today, all of us... <laughs> All of us have moments where we really need to focus on emotional regulation, right? On on not being so impulsive, not being so quick to act, of understanding where we go and how we work when certain levels of discomfort uh, are in the room with us. So one of the other really, really nice outcomes of helping people creating space, holding space for their clients. So I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed these, these first three episodes. I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing this season. Um, and we'll be back with you uh, maybe after the next three or four episodes of The Helping Conversation uh, to continue this specific conversation of highlighting those skills, those strategies, those ways of being, modalities, models that helping people utilize. And, and again, celebrating the people who do it, celebrating the folks out there who engage in this most complex, this most crucially important conversation with people. And again, maybe even more so given just where we are in the world right now, uh, to be out there in any shape or form as a helping person in the traditional helping role world, in, in the corporate world, clergy, entrepreneurs, teachers, Oh, boy, Lord knows, parents today of just what they're up against. We need to look around at all of the folks in our community who engage in helping others and celebrate that and highlight that and understand the complexity of it and the skill involved. The the skill that was described by Leah and Anisha and Aaron in how they facilitate their unique brand of helping others. It's, it's phenomenal. And, uh, and we, we just can't talk about it enough or celebrate it enough. So with that being said, I thank you for sitting in with me today on this episode of The Helping Conversation. I hope you found it worthwhile and maybe a bit educational. And for those of you who are out there engaging in the helping world, um, my hat is off to you. Keep doing what you're doing. And I will look forward to speaking with you again on the next episode of The Helping Conversation. Have a great day, everybody. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of The Helping Conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast, so we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. For more information on Keith Greer and this podcast, log on to keithgreercoaching.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration 
of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation.